I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. There's a reason why most things you do should fail. It's because... If everything you do succeeds, either you're the best human being on the planet or you're not experimenting enough. And so experimenting is something I like to do in order to learn things very quickly with potentially huge upside and very little downside. And the more experiments you do in life, I don't wanna say the more interesting your life is, I don't wanna say the more successful you'll be, the smarter you'll be or the more experiences you have, but some combination of all of those will happen. But also you will fail an enormous, enormous amount. Like I'm gonna talk about a few experiments that I've done. One is when I started the company Stock Picker. So I started Stock Picker in 2006 and it was like a social media site combined with an investment site. But there were really 10 projects I started at the same time. I started all these dating sites. I started a dating site for smokers. You know, there, you know, there's a site hot or not where you rate people, whether they're hot or not hot. Well, I started a, a website smart or stupid. And so you would see someone's picture and you would say they're stupid or they're smart. And then you would see their results on an IQ test. So if you signed up for the site, you had to take an IQ test you would determine if you were good at judging whether people are smart or stupid, but you could also message people. So it was like a dating site. So I started like 10 of these. And by the way, my six-year-old daughter, Josie, came up to me and said, uh, that seems a little mean. And she was right. That was mean and it didn't work out. But I started like nine different websites like that, you know, news sites, dating sites, a finance site called Stock Picker. All of these were experiments. I set up one kind of platform. And I was able to make all these websites out of this platform. And so nine of the businesses that I started or websites, whatever you want to call them, didn't work out. They didn't get any traffic. I had some business deals actually that I was working out. Like I had an online beauty contest. I think I had iBeauty.com and I had this online beauty contest that I set up and I was going to do a deal with this big uh, woman's magazine. So I was doing trying to do deals too, but just wasn't getting traffic. It just wasn't working out. Stock picker worked out for reasons also related to experiments. But 
the whole idea is if I wasn't in an experimental mindset, maybe I would have started one site. And then when it didn't work out, I would have said, okay, I can't experiment anymore. I got to get a job. Or maybe, I mean, even after nine websites that we started, my business partner and I, we were thinking of not doing the 10th one. And the 10th one was stock picker. So it was good that we kept experimenting. But here's, here's what an experiment is. An experiment means you have a hypothesis about what might work. So for instance, my hypothesis for one of these websites, and I'm going to describe lots of different types of experiments that I did, but I had this hypothesis that there should be a dating site for just people who smoke. Whether it was a bad hypothesis or not, there's no judgment at the hypothesis stage. Then you construct a way to test out your hypothesis like any other experiment. And the experiment should have very little downside and enormous upside. So if that dating site had worked, it would have been a valuable business potentially. And all the smokers in the world would finally find true love. I'll tell you, there was this one story. Somebody signed up for the site and they posted a picture of themselves and they were smoking about 30 cigarettes in their mouth. Their mouth was like wide open. And they were, this girl was smoking 30 cigarettes simultaneously. So it was kind of funny. In any case, an experiment should have very little downside, enormous upside, should be relatively cheap or almost free to do, and you should be able to do it very quickly. And the reason why an experiment has very little downside, there's really no downside. Thomas Edison is famous for doing this experiment where he did 10,000 experiments finding the right filament for a light bulb. And someone asked him, uh, how does it feel like to fail 10,000 times in a row? And he said, I didn't fail 10,000 times in a row. I just found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. So he had very little downside each time. And then he found the right way to make a light bulb. And so that he had huge upside, but he learned on each one of the 10,000 experiments he did. So I learned a dating site for smokers is not very interesting, or at least I didn't know how to do it. And stock picker, finally, that was a site that got a million users in the first month. That was an experiment that worked. But experiments don't have to be businesses. They can be big or small or whatever. Like when I first started writing, I was very interested in how to be as productive as possible, but still spend time with my friends. So I did two experiments. I wanted to sleep eight hours a day. It's always important to sleep eight hours a day. But instead of sleeping from like midnight to 8 a.m., I would sleep from four to eight in the afternoon and four to eight in the morning. So I still slept eight hours a day, but I divided it up into two four-hour segments. And this way, from 8 p.m. to midnight, I would hang out with my friends. Then they'd all go to sleep or whatever. And then from midnight to 4 a.m., I would write. So I had four hours of writing time. Then from 4 to 8 a.m., I'd sleep. Then from 8 to 4, I'd go to school or write or whatever. And then from 4 to 8 in the afternoon, I'd sleep. And then from 8 to 12, I'd hang out with my friends again. So that was an interesting experiment, had very little downside and didn't really have enormous upside, but it was, uh, and I was very productive during that time. I would do it again, but you know, sometimes life gets in the way of experiments like that. There was another sleeping experiment I did. These were all experiments about productivity. So I, I decided to have a 25 hour day instead of a 24 hour day. I would sleep eight hours, but I would stay up an extra hour each night. So let's say I slept from midnight to eight, then the next day, I'd stay up till one in the morning and sleep from one to nine. Then the next day, I'd stay up till two in the morning and sleep from two to 10. So I had a 25 hour day. So there was a period where I would sleep all day and be up all night and I was very productive. And then there was more periods where I was more social, where I had a normal schedule. So all fun, all experiments. A lot of experiments have unexpected results. You know those disinfectant wipes that everybody hands out now because of COVID? It's these wipes you pull out and, and you uh, disinfect your hands. Well, that started out as an experiment. It was these isopropyl wipes that were used to clean um, the inside of computers, transistors. But then he, the guy who made it, I forgot what company he was working for, everybody was asking to borrow his wipes just to wash their hands. So he realized, oh, this is a much better use. And he started selling disinfectant wipes for hands. So a lot of times you do experiments and it gives you knowledge and unexpected things happen. So I remember one time 
Comedy Central asked me to do some consulting for them. This was in 1995. They wanted me to set up like an intranet for them because I had done it for HBO and HBO owned half of Comedy Central. So Comedy Central was aware of what I had done. So I visited Comedy Central and they said, can you do an intranet? And I said, and they said, we'll pay you. And I said, I don't want to get paid. I said, I'll only do it if you give me the 3 a.m. time slot on Comedy Central. I said, you're only using it for commercials. So let me do a show called 3 a.m. during that time slot. And to her credit, the head of the IT department said, okay. And she asked Doug Herzog, who was the CEO then, and he said no, as he should have. And I figured, okay, well, that experiment didn't, that wasn't really an experiment, but that didn't work out. And it was just an off the cuff idea. But then I was thinking about it and I said, oh, maybe I'll do it for the HBO website, which I was building. So I did an experiment. I went to the CEO's office. And let me tell you, when the CEO of HBO is your boss's, 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 boss, you don't just go to his office. But that was really the experiment. An experiment also should be something you're a little bit afraid to do. You don't know something. There's some knowledge you're missing. So my theory, my hypothesis was, why do I need to ask my boss? We'll ask his boss. We'll ask his boss. My hypothesis was, I could just ask the CEO. If he said no about me doing this project called 3 a.m. for HBO's website, then no one would ever know. And if he said yes, then all the bosses in between him and me wouldn't care because this is orders coming down from the CEO. On my way walking over there, when you're a scientist of your own life, this is what's going to happen. I ran into this woman who was one of the heads of marketing, and she said, you can't do that. You can't just go to the CEO's office. And what she's really saying is that she can't do it. She wasn't able to do it. So she didn't want me to do it and potentially do something that was strange for her. Everybody likes everybody where they are. They don't want you to suddenly leap up ahead. You can't just jump over all the bosses and talk to the CEO. You can't just go to the CEO's office. So success is always on the other side of you can't do this. So I went to the CEO's office. He looks up at me, Jeff Bukas. He looks up at me and when I walk into his office and he's like, who are you? And I said, oh, I just wanted to tell, I work in the IT department. I just want to tell you this idea. Just like how HBO does all this original programming, all these TV shows, like at the time it was the Larry Sanders show and um, a couple other shows. And I said, why don't you do original web shows on this new thing, the web? And he said, all right, do whatever you want. He just waved his hands. I don't care. And so I went back to my boss and I said, the CEO said I have to do this. So I started doing it. I, I called this web series 3 a.m. And the whole thing was a scary and it was an experiment. I would go out at three in the morning on a Tuesday night and I would interview anybody who was out at three in the morning on a Tuesday night. Prostitutes, pimps, drug dealers, Johns, homeless people, Wall Street bankers. Those were the only people that I was really afraid of were the Wall Street bankers. They did not like anybody talking to them. You know, and then I, I did I, I decided, okay, well, let's ask the TV show department. Sheila Nevins was in charge of HBO documentaries. I said, why don't we make this a TV show now? It's a successful website. So she gave me money to shoot it as a pilot. And I learned, I learned a huge amount about making a TV show, about interviewing people. I had never really interviewed people before. And now I interviewed thousands of people during the few years that I did 3 a.m. And then what happened was other companies saw this website I was doing and they said, could I do something similar for them? And so this turned into a whole company. It turned into my first successful company called Reset, which made websites for other companies. And it was a huge success. So this one little experiment, which started off with me just on the fly asking Comedy Central for an hour of TV exposure at three in the morning, turned into a company that I made millions from. And then, of course, two years later, I was dead broke but that's the subject of another podcast perhaps or many other podcasts that I've already done. You know, so 3 a.m. was an experiment that it was scary. It was scary to ask the CEO. It was scary to actually do it. I was afraid of failing. I was afraid it wouldn't be interesting. It was scary to make it as a, try to make it as a TV show. I had to come up with really good ideas that would be good for TV. 
So I could have just led a normal life and continued being a computer programmer in HBO's IT department, but experimenting with all of these things that I was afraid of in order to do something that I liked doing, it was scary, but I learned a lot and it led to, again, my first business, which was, you know, running a business is not easy either. When you do something that you love doing, doesn't mean you love it all the time. All it really means is your creative juices are firing. And so, and that gives you energy, but it doesn't necessarily mean you like it because you're going to often fail when you do these experiments. So when I was running my company, there were so many problems, problems with employees, problems with clients, problems with landlords, problems, you know, when we were getting sold. So anything that's worth doing in life, you're probably going to hate it about half the time. Like when I do stand up comedy now, maybe it's not half of the time, but some percentage of time, I don't really feel very good about my performance. In fact, I might feel miserable about it. You just have to deal with it. That's the process of learning. But experimenting is the way to learn the fastest. I see this with everything. Like I see this with comedy. I saw it with investing. I saw it with chess. I saw it with entrepreneurship. But like, I'll give comedy as an example. A lot of times I see people go up on stage and they do the same jokes every time in the same motions. They move their body the same way. They do the exact same thing second by second. And then a year later, they're still doing the same. And a year later, they're still doing the same. A year later, the same. If you never experiment, you're not gonna get better. These people are never gonna be famous comedians or, or they're never gonna make huge amount of money from comedy because they're getting afraid to try something different. When you try something different in comedy, you could easily fail. And it's hard to fail in a comedy club. Like everybody's just, hey, this is what failing in a comedy club looks like. You're on the stage and everyone is either talking or they're just looking at you. See, it's even heckling is fine because heckling is energy and you could take that energy and twist it around. But if they're just silent or if they're just talking to each other, that is the worst feeling and you just feel like crap. And maybe the comedy club owner is watching and you start thinking in the middle of your set, you start thinking, oh my gosh, I'm why is the comedy club owner seeing me on my worst ever performance? They're never gonna invite me back. So you always wanna do good. So it's safe to do your old material that you know is good. I mean, a great example of this, and I'm gonna do a full review of Seinfeld's new book, Is This Anything? But Seinfeld, still does the same material sometimes from the seventies because he's got, he, he worked really hard and making great jokes. And look, he's a different case because his jokes are truly fantastic and he does still write some new material, but even Seinfeld will use old material when he, when he needs to, when he knows it works and he needs a certain kind of laugh, but with comedy to get better. And this is like to get better at anything. I was experimenting all the time. So for instance, I needed to get better at doing one-liner jokes, a few words and people start laughing. I need to get better also with an audience that didn't necessarily like me. I needed to learn how to win an audience over. People think doing stand-up comedy is all about sense of humor. That's one part of it, of course, but you know, you have to be able to get the audience to like you. You have to improv on the fly. You have to do crowd work. You have to do stage work. You have to do voices. You have to act out some of your jokes. So, was on the, so, so I, here's what I did. Here's the experiment I did. I went on the subway and a friend of mine uh, was videotaping me and I got so scared. I said, forget it. I'm not doing this. We're wasting our time. We're just going to take a subway ride. And then I told my friend, all right, just turn on the camera just for the heck of it. And then as soon as the camera was on, I started doing some stand-up. and it was not good, by the way. It was stuff like, Hey, everybody, I ordered an Uber pool, but they sent me this subway car instead and jokes like that. Or, or I would start doing push-ups on the thing. You know, you hold this thing up high to, to, so that you don't fall over. I started doing pull-ups on that and telling everybody around me I was working out. I don't know. I did all sorts of dumb stuff. Was the experiment a, a success or a failure? Well, it was a success because not only did I do comedy under very tough conditions, but I also have a story that I tell about it. So it gave, it gave me, the upside is it gave me a story. I probably got a little better at comedy and I had a fun video to show my grandkids. So who knows? And it gave me some jokes that occasionally I might still do. So 
I did another experiment in comedy once. I wanted to play what I call the air piano. So you know how you play the air guitar. There's a song playing and you put your hand on your chest and your other hand is in the air and you play the guitar as if you're playing the guitar. Well, the air piano is the same. I took the song uh, Great Balls of Fire by uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and there's a lot of um, big uh, grand piano motions in it. So, and there's a lot of like uh, where they, he, he runs his fingers across all the keys and then he bangs down on some of the keys. So I totally did it. I practiced for weeks and I totally did Great Balls of Fire completely in sync with the song. It was, it was funny to, to watch it. I, I made a video, but I took it down. And, but when I did it on stage at a comedy club, I thought it was funny. And a couple other people who saw the video later thought, I think they were honest and they said it was funny. But the audience, their mouths opened up and they were just staring at me. They were like, what the hell is this guy doing? But it was an experiment. This was not only an experiment in will the air piano work or not, but this is an experiment in what's called committing to the bit. So once you start a joke, you kind of have to commit to it to the end. Or like, what was I going to do in the middle of the song when nobody was laughing? Was I just going to say, well, that didn't work. I could have done that. That would have been a way to do it. But instead I committed to the bit. I went, I did the whole thing because I knew the end was the funniest part. So we did the whole thing and it was like three minutes and it was three minutes of like people just thinking, what the hell is this guy doing? And just staring at me. So that experiment didn't work. Again, most experiments should fail. If, if too many experiments succeed, you're not experimenting enough or you're not going out of your comfort zone enough. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks, 
even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. One time I decided, oh, let's make a TV show. You know, a lot of times you see these comedy specials where it's a comedian standing on a big stage telling jokes for an hour. Well, I happen to think that's pretty boring in most cases. It's hard to listen to people even for 10 minutes, let alone an hour. In fact, there's a rule in public speaking. After 10 minutes, you have to do something that's going to re-engage your audience. You have to do something crazy that's going to re-engage the audience. I didn't really like the typical comedy special, but I wanted to make a comedy special. You know, I had a comedy club. I talked to the MC and I videotaped the MC sets. The MC is the person who introduces each comedian. So if there's six comedians per night, she might be introducing six and telling jokes between each one of the six different comedians. And so I videotaped her. I videotaped one or two jokes from each comedian. And then I would interview 
the comedian afterwards. And so I did a whole special out of this, which I did nothing with. I still have it lying around. I think I, think I should probably release that actually. So it was kind of funny. I thought it was funny. And so that was an experiment and it got me a whole TV show, which I never released. All right, here's another good one. This led to all of my future success. In fact, every one of my experiments either was a failure where I learned something or led to huge, huge success. So I was just starting writing 10 ideas a day down. This was like in 2001, 2002. This became like a lifelong practice for me. I wrote down a list of 10 people I wanted to speak with. So I would write like Warren Buffett I want to speak with. And I'd send him an email, please meet me and have a cup of coffee. And of course, nobody responds. Zero people responded. When people write to me even, hey, can I come by there and buy you a cup of coffee? I'm not going to respond because it's almost like a homework assignment for me. But I did an experiment. Instead of just asking for something, I researched each person that I wanted to meet with and I came up with 10 ideas for their business. And then I shared the ideas with them without any hope. And I would write, here's 10 ideas that you should do for your business. I'm a big fan. Here's 10 ideas. You never have to respond to me. I don't want anything. Enjoy these ideas and so on. I sent 10 ideas to 20 different people. So 200 ideas, three people responded. And I've spoken about this before, but one of them gave me a job as a writer because I had pitched 10 ideas for articles he should write. And another person invested in a hedge fund I started. He was my first investor because I gave him 10 pieces of software I'd written to model the markets. Now, people would say, how could you just give away all these ideas? Why don't you just do them yourself? I never worry about that. If you have an abundant mindset and you're always experimenting, you're always going to come up with new ideas, new passions. Nobody can really steal your idea. And if they can, and if they can do it better than you, then power to them. Like then just, again, you're abundant, just move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. What ended up happening was I started a career as a writer. The writer was Jim Cramer and he said, these ideas are great. Why don't you write them? And I started writing for the street.com. I made my first $200 check writing. And then with the hedge fund manager, I started a hedge fund. And so this started two different tracks of my career. It was huge for me. And so uh, that, that ended up leading to Stock Picker, which I sold to the street.com, Jim Cramer's company. And I wrote books about hedge funds and finance. I don't know. I, I had a, a big 10, 15, 20 year career from all this. In fact, I still do some finance stuff and it led to all sorts of connections that led to me investing in lots of good opportunities. Those experiments worked out. Always sharing ideas is always a form of experiment. Some experiments are real small. Like for about six straight months during the lockdown, I only wore pajamas. I wore pajamas on planes. I wore it to restaurants. I wore it walking around. I went to the protests in pajamas. I want to do an experiment to see how people responded to pajama wearing outside because maybe I can make a clothing line that's like pajamas, but pajamas as outerwear. Well, I think it's a good idea still, but I just haven't done it. But, uh, but what I did learn was that people liked the pajamas I was wearing. So if I throw in some designs there and I spoke to fashion designers who thought it was a great idea and the experiment sort of worked and I learned a lot and I even learned a little bit about, you know, how to source the pajamas and how to get designs on them and so on. And for a while I was thinking of copper infused pajamas. And so I wore some copper infused pajamas because copper is a natural disinfectant. So I thought this would be like anti-COVID pajamas I could encourage people to wear. So anyway, I did nothing with that idea, but that's fine. I'm abundant in ideas. You should do that idea. It's actually a good idea. I've done some crazy experiments. Like one time, this is 2007, I think, I was dead broke and I was getting a divorce. I was upset and depressed. So I put an ad on Craigslist. I said, listen, I had a bicycle injury and I was in a coma. And when I woke up, I was psychic. So feel free, ask me questions, ask me anything you want and I will answer. And so I went out to lunch, came back. I had hundreds of emails from this Craigslist ad. And what was the point of this experiment? My hypothesis was this would be an interesting way to have human contact 
and have meaningful email discussions with other people because I was feeling lonely. And I was correct. I started emailing all these people who had all these problems. Most people, the problem was they had a crush on their boss at work and they wanted to know what to do about it. But there were some other issues as well. I did that for the rest of the day and I ended up being good friends with several of the people that I, I'm still friends to this day. With. So my whole point is figure out ways to surprise yourself. Figure out ways to do experiments. I didn't mean to talk about this one because I have a huge plan for this one. But right after the election, I figured, oh, how hard is it to run for president? Is it really the case that Joe Biden and Donald Trump are the two best people in America to be president of the United States? Is it like that hard? So I went to FEC.gov, federalelectionscommission.gov, and it took me five minutes to fill out the forms. And now I'm an official candidate for president in 2024. Now that experiment is not done yet. I have a huge plan for that one. So stay tuned, but I'm making a website to go along with it with my platform. And it's a ex very experimental sort of platform, but stay tuned on that one. Here's another one I did that, that turned out to have huge results 20 years later. Back in 1992, I was writing tons of short stories. This is really when I was experimenting with a lot of writing. Getting better at writing is all about experimenting. Oh, try writing a story in the second person. Try writing in the third person omniscient. Try writing um, an article which is all letters between you and someone else. There's all sorts of different forms in writing that you could experiment with. If you want to write an article, here are the 10 things that are going to happen in 2040. Write a little short story about what's happening in 2040. I don't know. There's plenty of ways to experiment with writing, and that's how you get to be a better writer. Write in the style of Ernest Hemingway. Write in the style of F. Scott Fitzgerald. Write in the style of a politician running for president. But one experiment I did was I wanted to publish, and no publisher wanted to publish me. And there wasn't there wasn't such thing as Amazon then, so I couldn't just upload and self-publish. So here's what I did. I printed up my stories, but I made them really small type. I chopped every eight by 11 paper up into nine different pages. And I printed the story on those pages and I clipped together little books, about hundred pages of my short stories. And then I walked around from bookstore to bookstore and I said, can you sell this at the cash register for 25 cents? And that was my first self-published book, but it got me comfortable self-publishing. And 23 years later, or 21 years later, I self-published Choose Yourself, which was a huge success. And everyone always says, oh, you can't self-publish. That's only bad writers do that. Well, first off, I've published books with regular publishers and I've self-published. I enjoy the process of both. Sometimes you do one, sometimes you do the other. That's what experimenting is for, to know when you should do what for which situation. But I self-published Choose Yourself and it was a huge success. But my first experience self-publishing was a full 21 years earlier. So again, what are your experiments right now? What are you doing right now that's an experiment in your life? Like even with like podcasting, this podcast with no guests is an experiment. Or when I do Side Hustle Fridays on Fridays, that was an experiment. Or when I used to do the Instagram Lives and make them podcasts, that was an experiment. For six years, I did Twitter Q and A's every Thursday. That was an experiment. Experiments will change your life. Remember, have a hypothesis, construct an experiment that doesn't cost any money or very little money. It should be very quick to implement and it should have very little downside, i.e. you should just learn something and it should have enormous upside. If you hear a noise in the background, that's because my wife is experimenting and she bought a goddamn cockatoo and it's making noise in the other room. One of these days it's gonna speak and I'm afraid of that because then it's gonna start repeating everything we say. By the way, even with marketing, marketing is all about experimenting. Like when I wrote Choose Yourself back in 2013, I did an experiment. I created a, a store, an online store that only accepted Bitcoin and it was only had one product in the store, which was my book. I pre-released it and you could only get it if you spent one-tenth of a Bitcoin. Bitcoin was $61 then and went on CNBC and they said, did you just do this as a marketing gimmick? And I'm like, well, I'm on national TV, so I guess it worked. And that was an experiment. And it got, and it exposed me, doing that experiment exposed me for the first time to 
the benefits and the wonders of Bitcoin, which many years later, I did a newsletter about and I acquired some Bitcoin and did well with that. But again, most experiments fail. One experiment that I recently did was I was going to buy an app on one of the app stores and it just didn't work out. I ended up wasting everyone's time and I spent a little bit of money, probably a little bit more than I should have. And it just was a resounding failure. But my point is, even my New York City is dead article, which got so much anger against me, was an experiment. I did intend to write the article. The experimental part was this is the first time I ever wrote an article that wasn't optimistic. I didn't have an optimistic conclusion. And so I was very nervous when I hit publish. So every experiment should make you a little bit nervous as well. Doing experiments is the way you punch through your comfort zone. Some people say, oh, you got to do 10,000 hours. You got to do repetition. No. Experiments, you'll learn so much faster. And I'll give you one last example. There was this guy in the 60s named Dick Fosbury, and he was a high jumper. They would run and jump over a high bar. That's an Olympic event. And so he wanted to do an experiment. So he would run, I guess it was like backwards, and he would flip over the bar backwards, and he would go so much higher by doing this because he couldn't jump forwards. There's that cockatoo again. He couldn't jump forwards because his legs were so long. So he did this backwards flip, and that became known as the Fosbury flop. And now everybody who does the high jump does the Fosbury flop. So you don't need 10,000 hours. He just needed that one experiment in order to figure out the way that now every Olympic athlete does this one event. So ask yourself, what experiments are you doing right now in your life? What experiments can you do? Let me know if you like this episode. Leave a review. Let me know if you want more experiments. Here's an experiment I would suggest trying today. Go back in your Gmail or email or whatever. Go back to like 2013, 2012. Find an email that you never responded to. Hit reply and respond as if you just got their email a minute ago, even though it was back in 2012. So do that. That's a small experiment. See what happens. Have fun with it. And stay tuned for the next episode. Thanks. Entresto, Sucubitril Valsartan Tablets, is the number one heart failure brand prescribed by cardiologists and has helped over one million people with heart failure. It's a prescription medicine that treats adults with long-lasting chronic heart failure and works better when the heart cannot pump a normal amount of blood to the body. Don't take Entresto if pregnant. It can cause harm or death to an unborn baby. Don't take Entresto with an ACE inhibitor or Alice Kieran. Or if you've had angioedema with an ACE or ARB. Don't take with Alice Kieran or within 36 hours of taking an ACE inhibitor. The most serious side effects are angioedema, low blood pressure, kidney problems, or high blood potassium. Angioedema is swelling of your face, lips, tongue, and throat that may cause death. If it causes difficulty breathing, get emergency help. Ask your doctor about Entresto. To learn more, visit support.entresto.com or call 833-446-6699. For pricing, visit entresto.com backslash cost. If you can't afford your medication, Novartis may be able to help.